Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, which is called Mars Incorporated, Our Sustainability Journey. I'm Victoria Mills from the Environmental Defense Fund, and I'm delighted to be your host today. I'm here in EDF's Washington, D.C. office with our featured speaker, Lisa Manley from Mars. Say hi, Lisa. Hello, Victoria, and everybody on the line. Lisa is Senior Director of Sustainability Engagement and Partnerships at Mars and is a driving force behind the company's Sustainable in a Generation Plan, which you'll hear about soon. Our goal for today's webinar is to give listeners a sense of what leadership looks like in sustainability through Mars's example and to share some concrete steps that any company can take to improve environmental performance no matter where you are in your own sustainability journey. So thank you for joining us. Here's our agenda for the hour. First, Lisa will share a brief presentation on Mars's Sustainable in a Generation Plan, and in particular, how the company is responding to climate change. Then I'll kick off the discussion with a few questions for Lisa, leaving plenty of time for questions from listeners. So be sure to make a note of your own questions along the way. And finally, I will wrap up with some closing comments and some resources available to businesses that want to go further on their own sustainability journey. So before we begin, some quick housekeeping announcements. Um, you can submit your questions directly into the chat box on the right side of your page where it says Q&A. And today's webinar is being recorded, and we're going to share the final recording and slides with participants tomorrow. So with that, uh, over to you, Lisa. Super. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and thank you to EDF for the opportunity to join today's webinar. And also, thank you to everybody who has um, joined the line and is going to be spending the next hour with us. We appreciate your interest in both what Mars is doing to advance our Sustainable in a Generation plan, but also um, what businesses, large and small, throughout the U.S. can do to drive climate action. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I was hoping to spend some time talking about four things. One, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about Mars Incorporated, what our business is all about and how we have been growing and expanding over the past few years. Then want to spend most of our time talking about our sustainability journey, where it started and where we have gone in launching our Sustainable in a Generation plan in September of last year. And then within that, spend um, a good portion of, of that 15 minutes talking about our climate action work and specifically bringing light to why we see a real business case for not only the investments that we're making in the Sustainable in a Generation Plan, but also specifically the investments that we are making in climate action. And then as Victoria has said, we are holding a good bit of time for some Q&A. So hopefully um, as we move along, you will have questions and um, we'll have a good conversation. So starting perhaps with a little bit about our company. So Mars is a private company owned by the Mars family. We've got about $35 billion of net sales on an annual basis. And the heart of our organization is really the 150,000 or so associates or employees who work for our business all around the world. We're most known for the confectionery portion of our business, so you can see some of the logos on the screen, but those are brands like M&Ms and Twix and Snickers, among others. What we see as the fastest growing component of our business is pet nutrition and healthcare. And again, you can see some of those brands on the screen with brands like Whiskas and Pedigree, Iams, Neutro, among others. And then we've got a small but really important um, business within food and drinks with brands like Uncle Ben's. And then last but not least, we've got an innovation incubator with Mars Edge. And on the next slide here, what we can see is the relative size of our business segments. So again, it sometimes surprises people that uh, our pet care business is almost as large as our confectionery business, and that those two segments, pet care and confectionery, comprise about 90% of our net sales, and the balance of our sales come from food and from drinks. 
And people sometimes ask, you know, how big is your global footprint, meaning where can you buy Mars products? And the answer there is you can buy them just about everywhere um, around, the pl- around the globe. And not only can you buy them, but we also produce them um, in 80 countries all around the world. The largest portion um, of our sales and our production comes from here in North America, but we've got a sizable portion of our business in Europe, in the Middle East, and Africa, and a very fast-growing business in Asia-Pacific. So that is um, a snapshot of our business, and now we can turn to our Sustainable in a Generation Plan. So in September of last year, just about a year ago, we launched what we thought was a really ambitious program. We called it our Sustainable in a Generation Plan, and it has a billion dollars worth of financial investment um, against it over the next few years. We focused on three areas. One is Healthy Planet, so that's our environmental strategy. The second is Thriving People. That's our work around human rights and farmer income and unlocking opportunities for women. And then the final bit is called nourishing well-being. So that is a real look at what we make and how we sell it. And I think we had one uh, sort of overarching thesis that um, was was the backbone of, of the launch of this strategy, and that is that we looked at sort of the impact of agricultural supply chains, and we had a realization that for the most part, they are broken in very fundamental ways. They're no longer adding mutual value to the planet or to society. And so we really focused our our Sustainable in a Generation plan on trying to fix what is broken in global agricultural supply chains. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Now, I should say that um, the Sustainable in a Generation Plan is not the first um, focus that Mars has had in the sustainability arena. We set up a sustainability team back in 2008, so we've had a decade of focus in this arena. And like many companies, our focus began with our direct operations. So at the time that we set our original goals, um, what we really had a good sense about and what we felt like we had the the potential to influence were those direct operations. So our initial suite of goals were focused on things like energy use and water stewardship inside our manufacturing facilities. Um, What, though, we've learned over the past 10 years is we've learned that the vast majority of our impacts on things like climate change or water stress or human rights happen outside of our direct operations. We now have better science, we've got better data, we know that as a result of this better science and these better data points that we've got to be bolder with our ambitions throughout our entire value chain. And that is what we set forth in our our Sustainable Generation Plan. So let's turn to it for a quick second. Um, our, Our plan is focused on three interconnected ambitions that we believe are essential to sustainable growth at Mars. I mentioned the three of them, healthy planet, thriving people, and nourishing well-being. What you can see here are the primary, the leading goals that we have for each of them. With Healthy Planet, our goal is to reduce our environmental impacts in line with what science says is necessary to keep the planet healthy. With Thriving People, our goal is to significantly improve the working lives of one million people in our value chain to enable them to thrive. And then with Nourishing Wellbeing, our goal is to advance science, innovation, and marketing in ways that help billions of people and their pets lead healthier and happier lives. Now, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm largely going to focus on Healthy Planet, but when we get to the Q&A, if folks have questions about our work with thriving people or nourishing well-being, I'm certainly happy to, to take those on. So looking a little bit deeper at our Healthy Planet goals, we focused on three primary impacts, and those are our greenhouse gas emissions, water stewardship, and land use. And we worked really hard to align with what planetary boundaries and the science said was necessary for us to drive our business behavior moving forward. With climate action, we set goals to reduce our absolute greenhouse gas emissions across our full value chain by 27%, so about one-third by 2025, and by two-thirds by 2050. 
With water stewardship, we, we are aiming to cut unsustainable water use by half by 2025 and eliminate it entirely, and that's in our agricultural supply chains by 2050. And this third goal is, is somewhat unique. Uh, we haven't seen many other companies set goals around land use. But again, if you look at planetary boundaries, what they tell us is that we're right on the cusp of using more land than is sustainable for things like agricultural production. So we've set ourselves a goal to hold flat the total land area that's associated with our value chain. And it's important to note that, you know, with all of these goals, our anticipation is that our business is, is going to continue to grow, and yet we're going to hold ourselves to these rather ambitious um, uh, goals. Now let's turn to climate action, because I know that this is, is, is one of the, the, the areas that EDF is particularly active in, and um, Victoria and I are excited to, to, to have a, a bit of a conversation about the importance of climate action. At Mars, we're really focused in six areas with our sustainable net generation strategy related to climate action. I've talked a little bit about science-based targets, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about them in a moment. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of our commitments to renewable energy. Um, we've got a big global commitment here. Um, I mentioned our goal to hold our land use flat, which has a very close relationship to some companion goals related to halting deforestation in certain uh, supply chains. We'll talk for a few minutes about some of the work that we're doing to improve agricultural practices um, to help them be um, less carbon impactful. And then the last two areas we'll touch on, uh, one will be uh, the fact that where necessary, we're prepared to adjust not only what we source, but also where we source uh, um, in the future to ensure that we're able to align with the goals related to our sustainable and generation plan. And then last but not least, we're going to talk some about collaboration and advocacy. This um, is an incredibly important part of our strategy. The kinds of goals that we've set um, simply can't be achieved if we don't work very openly and very collaboratively with a whole host of, of partners. Um, and if we don't lend some of our, our public affairs uh, engagement to the really important work of advocating for things like climate action. So we'll take just a moment and talk a little bit more about um, science-based targets. I think um, you know, what to us has made sense about science-based targets is the fact that for far too long, um, businesses of all shapes and sizes have been setting incremental targets in the environmental space. We're all trying to do a little bit better. Um, oftentimes, we're, we're sort of setting our North Star in doing a little bit better than our competitors or our peers. But frankly, most of us aren't doing enough. Um, and if we trust the science, the science will point us toward the kinds of efforts that we need to be taking to be sustainable, whether that's with climate action, water stewardship, land use, or a growing array of, of science-based indicators in, in the social space as well. So we have trusted that science, and, and we've set the goals that I've, I've mentioned to you. Um, I think you know maybe one thing that, that would be important, and the slide is hard to see, so bear with me for a quick second, but um, it's important to know, that, again, that you know, while we started in our direct operations, and I'm, I'm speaking now to sort of the, the, the vertical bar um, on the left side of the graphic, our direct operations are only about 6% of our total greenhouse gas emissions around the world. So an important place to start, but as we look at what the science tells us is, is, is the primary elements of our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions, we see that those come from land use and agriculture. 75% of our emissions come from those two um, areas of our business. And so that's why I mentioned that within our six areas of focus, two of them are land use and agricultural production processes. Now, another area of our focus is renewable energy. So we were one of the, the first companies to sign on to the Climate Group's RE100 agenda and to set a target to eliminate 100% of the greenhouse gas emissions from our direct operations. And that's a time-bound commitment um, looking at um, eliminating those emissions by 2040. 
That's a big goal because, again, if you look at Mars's global footprint, you know that we've got about 450 sites all around the world, and we've got operations in 80 countries. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us um, to drive progress with renewable energy. I think, though, that this is probably one of the most exciting early indicators of progress that we have within the Sustainable Energy Generation Plan. So when we set this goal, um, you know, we, we began with some investments for, for on-site solar um, initiatives, so things that we could actually install within our production facilities. What we realized quickly is that we don't have enough land nor enough wind or sun where those production facilities are to drive on-site um, renewable electricity use um, at scale. So we quickly turned our attention to short-term power purchase agreements in some countries, particularly throughout, the, throughout Europe. Next year, we'll have about 81% of our European operations covered with renewable electricity. Um, and then we really began to dig into where we saw the biggest opportunity, which was making investments in long-term power purchase agreements. So here, if we, what we found is if we turn our attention to longer-term contracts, um, we're not only able to secure better rates in terms of the cost for renewable electricity, but we're able to send a signal to the marketplace that renewable electricity is worth business investment. Therefore, other businesses can follow along um, with, with the kinds of things that, that, that we're making investments in. And I should say here that um, you know, we've got long-term power purchase agreements in the U.S. to cover 100% of, of our greenhouse gas emissions in the UK to cover the same. In Mexico later this year, we will come online with 100% um, renewable electricity use. And just a, a, a few weeks ago, we launched, we launched or announced another long-term pu public uh, power agreement in Australia that will come online in 2019 and 2020. So we see a real business case um, for renewable energy, and um, that's a big area of our focus. Another big area of our focus, as I mentioned, is collaborating to drive scale around climate ad advocacy. And uh, um, we're doing that um, with a number of organizations. We're actively involved with the We're Still In agenda um, as a member of their leader circle. We are actively involved with the Series BICEP initiative, as well as with the Me We Mean Business initiative. Um, outside of these collective uh, organizational activities, we do a lot with individual NGOs to drive climate action. So Victoria and I are talking about the topic today, uh, um, which is just one indicator of, of some of the work that we do with EDF. Um, we have programs with WWF, with WRI, and a multitude of other um, NGOs that, 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 that give us an opportunity to work together in driving the advocacy and the collaboration that's necessary to really bring climate change and climate action to scale. One other thing I, I would mention that I think is important um, with regard to, to, to our strategy is we're really looking to get our executives and our board members actively involved in these conversations. So last year, for example, um, the, the, the picture on the upper right is, is a picture of um, a panel that took place during Climate Week in New York City. And the gentleman who is seated second from the left um, is Stephen Badger, our board chair at Mars. He participated in an in, in opening um, a panel about climate action along with Governor Brown and, and a number of others, and he left that session really energized about the potential that business has in driving action around climate. Um, and he left also a little bit agitated that we need to be going further as a business community. So what you see on the left with the, the image of the polar bear is a piece that he wrote um, and placed in the Washington post, um, really sort of calling business to account for the need for all of us to work harder together to drive climate action. The gentleman on the bottom is our Chief Sustainability Officer, Barry Parkin. Um, I show that to you simply to, to say that you know, he and, and we are, are actively involved with the various COPs. This is a, a picture of him from COP23 last year in Bonn. 
he, along with a number of us, will be at the Global Climate Action Summit in California next week. Um, and we think that, that, that turning up at these kinds of forums, lending our voice, uh, um, and playing an active role in the discussions is really important um, to both advance our strategy and use our voice in a productive way. And then the last um, image on here that I would call to your attention is just another example of our, our executive engagement in this space. Um, earlier this year during the World Economic Forum, our CEO, Grant Reed, uh, penned a joint op-ed with the, the, the head of WRI, Andrew Steer. Again, sort of looking ahead to 2018 and you know, putting a, a, a pin huh, um, for the business community and the importance of continuing to drive further action. In, in the climate space. So one of the questions we get pretty frequently, both inside our business as well as outside the business, is what's the business case for all of this action and investment, both uh, from a broad sustainability perspective, but also with regard to our investments in, in, in climate action? And when we, when we made the $1 billion commitment to the Sustainable in a Generation Plan, we didn't do that in a philanthropic um, way. We did it because we believe that that investment is going to return um, value for the company. And we're beginning to see early returns in at least four ways. One, I mentioned some of the cost savings that we're already experiencing with things like long-term renewable energy contracts. So cost savings are things that are beginning to, to, to add up um, as a result of these investments. We're also seeing some real risk reductions as a result of our investments in sustainable business practices. So looking at rice, perhaps, as one example, we're driving toward 100% sustainable rice um, uh, engagement. And that has repercussions for the amount of water that we use, for the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that, that, that are, 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 are released in our, our supply chains, as well as to the income that farmers receive as a result of, of being our partners in, in producing rice that, that, that we consume. Um, and I think what we're finding in our sourcing strategies with regard to rice, but not just rice, is that working with farmers and working um, collaboratively throughout our supply chain to, 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 to advance better sustainable agriculture practices is helping us to reduce the risks um, that confront our business, particularly with regard to risks in our supply chains in real significant ways. Another thing that is really exciting, I think, um, in terms of the business case is the fact that um, what we're finding is that this is probably one of the most energizing and motivating agendas that we have with regard to our associates. Our associates have been really excited to see the Sustainable in a Generation Plan come to life and to be part of the conversations and the engagements that allow it to, to, to sort of to, 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 to flourish throughout our business. And it's not just our current associates. We're also finding as we go into recruiting all around the world that more often than not, um, the people that are turning up to talk with us about potentially working at Mars, particularly the younger ones, but not just the younger ones, they know about this plan. They've studied it. They've got questions about it. And it's one of the things that they consider um, quite cautiously and carefully as they're making their decisions about where they're going to spend you know, a portion of their career. And then last but not least, we believe that there is the real opportunity to, to align our brands and their growth with this agenda. Earlier, I think I had a, an, an image on the, the slide about renewable electricity that um, included an M&M's character, and I didn't speak about the, the campaign then. But last year, uh, roughly about the same, that we, same time that we launched the Sustainable in a Generation Plan, our M&M's brand also launched a consumer-facing campaign called Fans of Wind. And it was a pilot, so you know, not a massive amount of scale, um, but the intention was to bring the M&M's brand into conversations with consumers about why renewable energy matters, what Mars is doing to advance renewable energy here in the U.S., um, and then importantly, how consumers can also be ambassadors for renewables. It was a very well-received um, campaign, and it gave us 
the, the, the sort of the, the momentum that we needed to actually appoint um, a brand purpose ambassador. So we now have a senior person in our business who is going to be looking at ways that we can advance these kinds of campaigns. How can we align our brands across each of our segments with material and relevant elements of our sustainable and a generation plan so that we can bring these conversations and so that we can bring calls to action to consumers, hopefully all around the world. Last slide before we turn to um, some, some, some conversation and then to your questions. Um, another thing that we frequently get asked is, what makes this strategy different? And I would say that there are really two things that make it uh, distinct and unique. One, um, we're really working to do what's right. Um, so again, we're aligning with the science. We're letting science be our guide as we've set our ambitions. We're not simply satisfying ourselves with doing things just a little bit better. That means that the ambitions are, are, are bold. Um, that means that we don't have all of the answers to, to, to where we are or how we are going to get there, but we know that it's the right path, um, and, and, and that's the way that, that, that we've sort of set the course um, for the next generation. And then the second thing that, that makes it different and distinct is that it's really anchored in um, uncommon collaboration. So again, we know that these agendas, these goals, these, these areas of focus are, are not things that we can advance independently. Um, we don't have all the answers. We're going to have to open ourselves up to a multitude of collaborations, collaborations with with, with NGOs, with our peers, and even our competitors in some cases. But we think that if we think differently um, and open ourselves up to those collaborations, that's how we're going to be able to advance the scale that is necessary um, to support this plan. So thank you for giving me a few minutes um, to, to, to tell you a little bit about um, our Sustainable in a Generation plan. And um, I'll now turn it back over to Victoria um, to see if she's got any questions that she wants to lead with. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that superb presentation. And um, kudos to Mars for embracing such an ambitious and comprehensive sustainability agenda. Um, we're going to get into our discussion now, and I just want to remind folks that if you'd like to ask a question, you can enter that question directly into the chat box on the right side of your screen where it says Q&A, and that we will be sending around these slides and the link to the recording of the webinar tomorrow. So you can have a chance to hear it all over again if you want. Um, as we get into our discussion, um, you can see not only what Lisa and I look like, but also on the right, some resources for companies that want to go further in their sustainability journey, some of which we have mentioned today, and some are additional EDF resources that companies can access um, in all of these elements. Um, I think you know when EDF thinks about what leadership looks like in corporate sustainability. It really includes a lot of what Lisa has been talking about here today. So it involves uh, setting ambitious goals, collaborating, working uh, through the entire value chain um, for to achieve scale, and supporting public policies that are consistent with your environmental goals. Um, so what I'd like to do is dive a little bit deeper into each of these um, elements. And, and starting with the goal setting, um, I would love to hear more from you, Lisa, about how, what was the process like to set those sustainability goals and, and what changed in your company once you had done that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it was a highly collaborative process. Um, it starts with, you know, really looking closely at, you know, what are the material impacts for a business like Mars. And as we looked at what was material to our business, we really sort of focused on, on five primary impacts. Um, so we looked at greenhouse gas emissions and water and land and the environmental space. We looked at human rights and income, particularly smallholder farmer income, in the social space. Um, so, so we started with you know, really understanding our materiality, um, uh, uh, assessing our materiality. 
We then move to the science. So, you know, once we know what our primary impacts are, what does the science says is necessary for a company like ours? So that's why we have set, specifically in the environmental space, science-based targets. In many cases, the methodology uh, to support those targets is still coming along. Um, so we have done and continue to do a lot of collaboration with consulting organizations and NGOs to help shape the methodology that we and others, we hope, will use to drive progress. Um, so again, I think you know a key point here is that this has been a highly collaborative process. And that's all sort of looking at it from the outside perspective. It's also been highly collaborative inside. So I told you a little bit about um, our, our business and the fact that we've got four segments that comprise um, our global business. Um, we are a highly decentralized company, so our segments do not sort of sit uh, uh, in, in, a, in a passive posture waiting for us to set goals and share them with them to implement. Um, we have a, a deep sort of diplomatic process uh, um, in reaching alignment on any goals that we set. So the goals that I've shared with you are actually re the result of you know, probably 18 months of internal diplomacy and external engagement around science and methodology. Um, now, the other part of, of Victoria's question was, you know, what's changed in our business since we set these goals? So I think um, you know, the, the, the time leading up to the, the, the announcement of our sustainable and generation plan and you know, the, the, let's say the, the, the few months afterwards, we're really focused on trying to drive understanding of why setting these goals matter and what the goals should be. I think where we've pivoted um, later this year and where we will continue to pivot moving into the next year is how are we actually going to drive the change that's necessary? So we've talked a little bit about investment. Part of that change is reorganizing our investments in the sustainability space. But another part of, of, of the change that is necessary is reorganizing our, 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 our teams. Um, so Barry Parkin is uh, and has been our chief sustainability officer for a number of years. But knowing that our plan is so focused on trying to fix the things that are broken in supply chains, we knew that he needed to take on a larger role. Um, so now he is both our chief procurement officer and our chief sustainability officer. Two things that when paired together give us the opportunity to make change um, at pace within our supply chain, or at least to begin to make that change. Um, we've also looked much more deeply at tin raw materials in the agricultural space that account for, in most cases, uh, um, about 80% of, of our impacts on, on the social and environmental issues that I've mentioned. Um, and you know, the other thing that, that we're doing that I think is going to be another really strong lever for change moving forward is we're beginning to look at um, incentives. So how are we incentivizing our executives and our senior managers so that they have some skin in this game? Um, we're not going to be able to make progress if these goals are simply embraced and advanced by a small team of sustainability warriors inside Mars. Um, the progress is going to come when our entire operation um, feels some responsibility and opportunity and eventually benefit um, for the progress that we're making. That's really helpful. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges associated with goal setting and, and in particular how you persevere toward goals that will take a generation to achieve? Yeah, there, there, there definitely are lots of challenges um, associated with, with setting these types of, of goals. Um, you know, I think one of, of the key challenges is, you know, business doesn't always like to sort of jump into um, uh, an activity when they don't know exactly where, where they're headed. Um, and I mentioned already that with some of these goals, we know that they're the right things that, 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 that our business needs to do but we don't have all of the answers for how we're going to get there. And so, you know, one of the challenges is getting the business to be comfortable with embracing some degree of ambiguity. Uh, um, we've got pathways that we feel confident are going to move us in the right direction, but we know that there are going to be collaborations and innovations and investments that lie ahead that we can't completely outline today. 
So that's certainly a, a, a challenge for, for many of us in the business community. Um, I mentioned already that um, you know Mars is decentralized, so you know it's challenging to get a, a massive global operation to align around uh, um, you know a discrete number of, of focal points and goals. Um, so you know we had to be quite patient um, with the time that it took to get the business to be aligned, um, but also quite persistent. Um, you know, had we not been persistent, I could imagine that we might still be sitting here um, sort of contemplating what should the goals be and when might we announce them. Um, so that combination of patience and persistence, I think, is, is, is one of the, the, the things that requ that's required to, to sort of deal with the, the, the challenge of building momentum inside a massive global organization. I think you know one of the challenges that we're just beginning to realize is that um, as our business grows and as we pursue new acquisitions, our targets are going to grow as well. Um, so with renewable energy, for example, you know we, we made our first power purchase agreement here in the U.S. to cover 100% of our direct operations at the time, um, but we now have made acquisitions that cause us to have to relook um, at um, additional power purchase agreements to cover the, the electrical needs that um, or the electricity needs that we have. And you know that's something that, that, that we're going to have to, to get uh, a little bit more flexible and facile around um, anticipating business growth and ensuring that the strategies that we're putting forth uh, um, are aligned with, with, with that anticipated growth, which can be challenging. So uh, shifting to the uh, kind of the next pillar of collaborating for scale, it sounds like that making that transition from focusing on your own operations to looking at driving environmental improvements through the whole supply chain. That's a really significant step. Um, what, was, what did you learn from what it took to accomplish that step, and what advice would you have for other companies as, as they consider making a similar leap? Yeah, so I mean, I guess, uh, you know, particularly for companies that are just getting started um, in, in thinking about or shaping their, their sustainability strategies, I think um, it's okay to start with your direct operations. Um, and, you know, I think it's, well, the important thing is to focus first on, first and, and, and only, really, on those things that are material to your business. So it's important to start with, with some sort of a materiality assessment. Then I think it's 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 perfectly fine to begin um, within your direct operations and to sort of begin to sort of build the muscles um, that that you're going to need to drive things more deeply into the areas of your value chain where you've got the largest impacts. Um, I think it's important to be willing to do things differently um, and to recognize that. You know, these, these, these kinds of goals will require some investments in the, 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 the upfront, but if we are patient with our, our capital and patient with our investments, um, you know, there's lots of, of research out there, and we're certainly seeing it here at Mars, to show that those, those, those investments will pay um, returns in the not-so-long future. So, you know, what we need to get comfortable with is setting goals uh, and making investments that are going to have a payback in three to six years rather than, um, you know, three to six quarters. Um, and that's a, a, a change um, for, for business. But we do think that there's, there's a real business case here. And I, I've mentioned as well, you know, the importance of, of collaboration. There's some great methodologies. There are some great NGOs doing work um, on these issues all around the world. Um, there's some great business organizations, whether it's the Consumer Goods Forum um, or uh, WBCSD, that you know are really trying to build communities of practice to advance uh, um, uh, impact at scale within the business space. So I would also encourage folks to, to look for um, the right collaborative organizations and um, the right partnerships. And, and speaking of, um, kind of driving bigger changes at scale, a, a really important way that Mars has shown leadership is by supporting public policies that reduce pollution and waste and improve public health. Can you talk more about how you see um, Mars's policy advocacy is integral to its sustainability agenda? 
Yeah, so I think um, you know we're increasingly increasingly recognizing that the the policy engagement is absolutely critical to to driving the pace of change that's necessary in in these agendas. Um, I mean, the the reality is that policy can either be an enabler or a barrier to sustainable change, and we need to fight against the barriers and we need to fight for the enablers. And I think on, on many of these, these these environmental issues that we're talking about, um, business has not been particularly active in the policy arena. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, but you know, one of the, the things that I think we're recognizing as we engage more um, in policy dialogues is that policymakers are interested in um, what business in, is doing in this space and, and really keen to understand the business case. Um, that business case has not been presented sufficiently um, to policymakers here in the U.S. Or, or elsewhere around the world. And I think, you know, who's better to present it than, you know, individual businesses who can talk about um, the impacts that we're having, the risks that we're facing, and the ways that policymakers can help to break down some of those barriers to, to sustainable change and really help us to enable um, the kind of action that's necessary. So, you know, in that vein, um, earlier this year, Mars invited uh, U.S. Senator Bob Casey to visit one of your f uh, facilities in Pennsylvania, and um, the slide shows a picture of that visit. Can you talk about how that visit came about and why you thought it was important to do? Yeah, so we are, we're, we're both spending more time on the Hill talking with um, uh, legislators about our Sustainable and a Generation Plan and inviting them into our facilities. Um, in this case, we invited the senator to see um, our Mars Wrigley Confection Factory in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And you know, it was a, a couple of things that we were hoping to accomplish there. You know, one, um, we thought it was a great opportunity to engage our associates and to give um, the senator an opportunity to tour our facility and get a closer look at sort of the people and the processes behind um, the production of, of, of many of the, the, the chocolate, chocolates and confections products that we produced. But also important, um, it gave us an opportunity to have a direct conversation with the senator and our, our business leaders about things like agricultural policy and international trade. And it also gave us the opportunity to talk with him about our Sustainable in a Generation plan. He expressed a great deal of interest in the plan, um, and you know that has just sort of opened up um, a new channel of conversation with with the senator and new channels of conversations with other policymakers, which which we think is exciting. Well, that's terrific. And I have one final question before we go to um, questions from participants, which is, uh, you mentioned that Mars will be attending the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, which is just next week. Yeah. Um, why do you think it's important for businesses of all sizes to be involved in events like that and, and in the public conversation about climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, that that particular um, event is, is so important because, um, you know, it is an, an opportunity for for all actors, businesses, state actors, local actors, NGOs, to come together to sort of continue the, the, the dialogue and the campaign for the We're Still In agenda. So to continue to express our steadfast support for climate science, to continue to express our steadfast support for the Paris Climate Agreement, and to continue to build knowledge and understanding about why things like um, climate science and the Paris Climate Accord matter to cities, to colleges and universities, to faith-based organizations, to businesses, um, and a whole host of, 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 of other actors. So we'll be there. Um, we will have, um, I guess, five of us um, will be there. We'll be speaking um, on, on various panels, both um, uh, at the Global Climate Action Summit, as well as various forums that are part of the affiliated events. Um, we'll be hosting um, a few small conversations on, on topics that are relevant to our Sustainable in a Generation Plan. We'll be listening, we'll be learning, um, and um, you know, we'll be part of the, the chorus of support for for, for, for the importance of keeping the U.S. Uh, um, and the global community uh, um, engaged with, with the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, we're delighted to have you there. 
So now let's go to the audience questions. Um, we've got quite a few, and I'm going to try to kind of consolidate some of them, um, and some of them I think Lisa has answered along the way. But um, several of them come back to the initial section on goal setting. And so there's a question of, um, you know, how did you come up for the, um, the thriving people with a million people? And, or how do you define what unsustainable water use is? Yeah, so so boy, we could have um a long conversation about um sort of the, the 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 words that we used and the the reasons that we've used each of those words because each of them was really thoughtfully considered again um working closely with with NGO partners among among many others. Um you know, with with water, um, you know, we have been working closely with WRI and their aqueduct tool to really understand water scarcity and water stress all around the world. So, you know, there there are good data points and assessments about what water stress is, where it exists, and we've been able to align our operations all around the world, including, um, you know, where we've got the preponderance of our sourcing and supply chains against um, these 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 water risk maps, and that gives us um, sort of a lens. It's an early lens, and the the, the science isn't completely perfect there. It's based on, you know, best, best available data. But that's given us a, a, an idea of where we believe we have sourcing in places that um, that are express, experiencing a level of risk that is unsustainable. And it's also allowed us to focus um, where we think that that, um, that, that that sourcing needs to either change in terms of the way that we source, um, the way that we work to support um, those watersheds, or when necessary, um, supporting some adjustments in where we source to move away from 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 places that are experiencing particularly acute uh, um, water stress. And then with with thriving people, uh, um, you know, one million I think is um, is is sort of the 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 early estimate of of where we think we can make a difference to the most vulnerable people in our supply chains. Um, so if we look at um, the number of smallholder farmers that, that exist in our supply chains, um, and if we look at you know where we think that we can drive the, the biggest um, uh, difference in, in, in areas like human rights and, and um, unlocking opportunities for people and improving farmer incomes, um, we came up with a million by looking at um, you know the, by putting the most vulnerable people uh, um, in focus. So the next question is I'm going to combine a couple, and they're about money. So what we had one uh, listener observe, wow, a uh, billion dollars, that's a remarkable commitment. How do you think about, is that you spending that over the lifetime of the initiative, over is how would, is that distributed? And another question relates to have you done any analysis of the return on investment uh, of your investments in sustainability? Yeah, so the billion dollars um, is largely over the next three or four years. Um, so it's by no means the total amount of the investment in driving progress against a plan that is really focused on the next generation. So you know, we think that it's a billion dollars that will help us to, to sort of set the course um, for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, but we can anticipate that there will be significantly um, more investments that are made to support this plan moving forward. And you know, our analysis of the, the return on investment is 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 still sort of uh it's still new. Um, you know, we've begun to track um the four areas of focus that, that I had mentioned. Um, we've begun to sort of track some of the financial indicators about um about cost savings, we've begun to track some of the financial indicators related to risk reduction. We've begun to try to assess the value of keeping associates employed longer at Mars because they feel good about what they are doing and what the company stands for, as well as um, the the value in 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 smaller times of of recruitment investments. Um, 
to bring new talent on board. And then we've got um, new, but we think promising information about um, brand growth um, that, that we think is, is pointing us in the right direction. So, you know, we don't yet have, um, you know, a balance sheet that um, we, we are, are prepared to, to put in, for example, our sustainable in a generation plan. But we certainly are working in that direction. Um, and, and I think all of the, the early indicators for us are that there are and there will continue to be, um, you know, real business returns for this agenda, and um, it's it, it, it's a good investment. Uh, um, and you know, that's coming from a a company that is you know led by some very business focused um, folks. And so, you know, if they're willing to make this investment, they're only willing to do it because they see the potential for return. We have some questions that are all around. Um, internal leadership at Mars. What moved, you know, from the get-go, what moved the company's leadership to make this major commitment to sustainability? How did the sustainability program get started? And how do you foster a culture within a company where meeting the sustainability goals is everybody's job? Yeah, that's a, a, a great series of questions. Um, so, you know, I think our business and, and most others, frankly, um, are motivated um, oftentimes first and foremost by risk. Um, so, you know, when you see that um, supply chains that have been, you know, rather stable, um, you know, just looking here in the U.S., when, you know, there have been certain uh, raw materials that we've always been able to source um, with, with minimal risk in California or with minimal risk in the southeastern part of the United States or with minimal risk in, 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 in the central part of, of, of this country. And when you look at sort of the horizon and the impacts of things like climate change, which are going to be moving some of those raw raw materials out of California or out of the southeastern United States or out of um, sort of the breadbasket um, of, of America, um, you know, we, we, we realize that, um, you know, that's a risk to our business if we can't um, better understand the issues that are impacting our supply chains and play a role in helping to, to minimize those risks. Um, so, so that I think was 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 certainly a a very important motivator for our business. I think another one, though, is you know Mars is a a, a principles based company. Um, we've got five principles. Uh, you know, one of which is is responsibility, and another of which is um, mutuality that have guided our business since um, the 1940s. And, you know, when, again, the, the, the data and the science are, are, are telling us that, um, you know, climate change is happening at a pace that was never expected and water stress is happening at a similar pace and farmers are living in, 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 in many cases in, you know, just deep and abject poverty. Um, I think we've recognized, we've recognized, our leaders have recognized, the Mars family have recognized as well that we can't be a mutual business um, and we can't be a responsible business if we don't, you know, really do everything that we can to try to drive change. Um, you know, I think the other piece is is related to the business case. Um, you know, I think that our internal leaders are convinced that there is a business case here, that we will, um, by putting sustainability and purpose at the center of our, our corporate brand and also by putting it more, more firmly at the center of our individual brands, we're going to build better connections with, with consumers. And um, I think that that's, that's an important thing because, you know, business is, is experiencing, you know, sort of a dearth of trust um, these days. And, you know, we certainly believe that you know, one of the ways that we can build trust moving forward is by being really purposeful in the way that we conduct our business. Building on that a little bit, um, do you conduct training for your associates in sustainability topics or do they learn about it on the job? And um, you know, what portion of the kind of sustainability work is carried out by the sustainability team versus by the staff in general? Yeah, a lot of training. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to remember the, the stats here, but um, if I were to talk with my colleagues who lead our internal communications, meaning the 
the communications that we have on a, on a daily basis with our associates all around the world, um, a significant portion of, of those engagements are focused on themes related to the Sustainable in a Generation Plan. So you know, we, are, we are both working to inform associates about what we're doing, but also to invite them to be active participants in helping to drive this agenda forward. And we do that, um, we do that through um, uh, websites that are, that are targeted to our associates. We do that through webinars like this one that we have uh, pretty frequently with different functions uh, um, uh, across the business. And um, you know, later this month, later later in September, um, we've been working on um, an augmented reality experience that we're going to make available to associates. And the the point there is that um, you know, when we talk about things like climate change or um, uh, smallholder poverty, uh, uh, smallholder farmer poverty, sometimes those things are concepts that are somewhat distant and difficult for people here in the U.S., for example, to, to understand. So what we've done is we've gone to our sources um, in, in rice and in vanilla and in cocoa, um, among others, and we've spent some time sort of filming um, the, the, the farmers in those sources sourcing locations, rather, um, and you know, this augmented reality experience will be a way for our associates to better understand um, where our products come from, how they're produced, and importantly, to understand um, the, the lives of, of people that produce the stuff that, that, that we make all around the world. Um, a question that I'm sure comes up a lot with regard to Mars as a privately held company. Um, how do you, how would you answer the question of, you know, the, the compelling business case that maybe, is it in fact any easier for you to do this stuff than it is for a publicly held company or as a larger company than it would be for a smaller company? Um, how would you see the business benefits that you're seeing as drivers for a company of any size, public or private? Yeah, so I mean, I think the business case is similar for companies, whether they are, are, are public or private. Um, I will say that, you know, I think Mars is in a very fortunate position because, you know, the family members, um, our owners, are, as I said, very committed to, 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 to a series of principles that sort of ground all of their business decisions. So, you know, where there might be, um, you know, I mentioned sort of this, 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 this rather lengthy process of internal diplomacy to align our, on our sustainable and a generation plan, I can imagine that that process um, might be even longer um, with, with, with some companies, but I don't know that that's necessarily a, a result of a, a sort of a distinguishing feature of public versus private. I think that it starts with ensuring that the leaders and the board really understand um, understand sort of the, the business case. I do think that there's there's probably at least one um, you know distinct benefit for uh, a privately held company like Mars, and that is that you know we are thinking about the next generation. We're not just thinking about the next quarter or the next year. So the Mars family is very keenly interested in passing the business on to the the, the fourth and the fifth generation of of, of their family. Family. And um, they know that to pass along a, 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 a vibrant and thriving business, uh, um, they are going to need to have uh, um, a very sustainable business. Um, so I think that they are willing and we are able to think on a longer term horizon. Uh, um, and, and that perhaps is, is, is one distinct benefit, um, not just for Mars, but um, for many privately held companies. So a final question from participants, and then I'm going to wrap us up here, is Lisa, what about this work keeps you up at night? Oh, gosh. Um, well, first, I mean, I've worked in the space for 20 years, so there's very little that surprises me. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think right now, if I'm, 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 I'm thinking about sort of some of the issues that keep me up at night, I feel really good about sort of the, the goals that we have set and the, 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 the partnerships that we're beginning to, to put forward. Um, 
I do lose a little bit of sleep about um, whether we're doing enough with regard to sustainable packaging. Um, we haven't talked about that today. Um, it could perhaps be a, 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 a conversation for the future, but I think we and, and, and every other consumer goods company needs to be thinking much more deeply and strategically about our approach to sustainable packaging. Um, and you know, I think probably the second um, you know maybe issue that um, you know causes me to lose a little bit of sleep uh, um, would be deforestation. Um, you know, I think that there are lots of commitments, ours included, to, to halt deforestation in um, supply chains, and we're making progress. But um, you know, we need to, to 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 continue to think about our theories of change um, with regard to how we halt deforestation. And I think that we need to, to, to continue to really build momentum, huh? um, not just within Mars, but you know, as a as a collective huh? um, on on that topic. So that's about all the time we have today. You know, as I reflect on our discussion, Lisa, I think what really stands out to me is how you have um, stretched the company in all three directions on goal setting, collaboration, and policy advocacy, and that those three things are very much interrelated and essential to your sustainability agenda. I think it's also really evident that businesses are key stakeholders, especially in climate and energy policies. And your voices matter and your stories are powerful. So, you know, for folks listening, I think a great place to start um, is by sharing your sustainability story with policymakers and with other businesses as Mars has. And EDF is here to help with that. Um, so feel free to e email me if you'd like to learn more about those opportunities. We will send a link to the recording and to the slides out tomorrow. And um, I just want to say thank you to Lisa for a wonderful presentation and a fascinating conversation today, and to everybody on the line for joining. We're adjourned. Thank you.